All right, welcome everybody to the March 30th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, two things that we must abide by on the call. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. The second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. For announcements, we have the standard announcement, the Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have something that you want to include in that newsletter, please do leave a comment on the wiki page um, that is for the upcoming newsletter that is linked in the agenda. Any other announcements that anybody has they'd like to make? If I may, um, this is really uh, David Boswell is doing the yeoman's work on this, and we really need help getting content. So if there's anything cool going on in your project, or your community, please let us know. All right, thanks, Rye. Any other announcements that anybody has? No, okay. Uh, so for quarterly reports, I did see the final approval come in on Firefly this morning. I did merge that into uh, the repo, so that one is completed. Thank you everyone for getting that um, approved so that we could merge it. Um, thanks Jim for adding the information, uh, even though Jim's not on the call, uh, adding the information that helped us to get that one merged. We did get the caliper report that came in this week. Um, I did see a few people who have reviewed that this morning. Um, if you haven't reviewed that yet, please do go ahead and review that. Any questions that anybody has on uh, Caliper at this point, though? No? OK. Um, so for the past due reports, we still have the Transact report um, that hasn't come in. Peter did volunteer last week to open an issue and a pull request uh, to talk about the fact that the work there is being moved to Libsatu. I did not see either of those things, um, but Peter's not on the call yet. So um, we'll follow up with Peter and see if we can uh, see what the status is for, for the issue and the pull request. For Hyperledger Ursa, um, that one also is due. There was a reminder sent to the Ursa folks on the 20th. Uh, Arun, it's probably worthwhile to send a second reminder and see if we can get them to um, provide their Q1 report. And then for Besu, I, um, we sent a reminder on the 24th, the day after it was due last Thursday. Um, the maintainers seemed unaware of the fact that they had to do reporting. Um, so there was some chat that happened in the BASU contributors that uh, was asking for what the requirements were um, and then uh, asked for the last report that was filed. When I went to look for the last report that was filed, it seems we didn't get the Q4 report um, from BASU either, uh, most likely because whoever the maintainers are now um, were not aware that they needed to do that. and. Uh, somehow at the end of the year last year, we did miss um, the fact that they didn't send the, that report in. So uh, we're still waiting to see if we can get the BASU report. Hopefully that one will come in, um, but uh, Arun for that one too, it's probably worth sending a, a second reminder um, to see if we can get a status update for when we might expect that. Any comments or questions on the, the reports? Okay, uh, so then for the next reports, they're gonna be the Q2 reports that are coming uh, starting on April 13th. So a couple weeks from now, uh, we have Cacti and Fabric due um, as the next reports that should come in. So for discussion items today, 
Uh, we do have a discussion item related to uh, the GitHub Actions. Um, so Dave, you brought this up in chat as something for us to follow up on. I uh, wanted to see, um, Ryan, if you had an update for us and, and what the status is there. Sure. So um, the CA team here at Hyperledger uh, coincidentally has a meeting later today with uh, uh, Linux Foundation board member and uh, GitHub SVP uh, Stormy over at GitHub. We're going to ask about this. And just as a reminder, um, I did go out and do some pull requests for Cacti to auto cancel stuff to try to make stuff work more seamlessly. Uh, I added some provisional runners to from BuildJet to a couple of projects to see if that would uncork things, how much it would cost. Uh, it looks like every PR on Cactus, I'm sorry, Cacti costs about $3 to run their CI chain. Um, so that's pretty expensive. Uh, Peter talked about trying to get some uh, support elsewhere uh, within Accenture. Yeah, I know. I see the I see the wow faces down there. Um, so I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but uh, pending the outcome of the meeting today, uh, I'll, I'll definitely have more to report back. Um, and I do, uh, I did some testing yesterday. Actually, I've been doing testing for weeks. And I found that one of the limitations is uh, that even though jobs are done and have reported their status, uh, they still show up as active and running and they hold on to runners for well over an hour. So on the on one of the cacti test polls that I did, the jobs were complete within about four minutes. And I just let one of the runners go until it timed out. And it was well over an hour after the job was done at BuildJet that that uh, GitHub released the runner back into the pool. That may have been part of the queuing problem. I don't know. I welcome all tips and pointers. Um, but that's that's where we are right now. Stephen. So anything from yesterday would be no good because git was github was down right you saw you knew about that i assume oh yeah yeah so it would be super interesting if that that same thing is observed on other other days hopefully they have better days than than yesterday it was a mess yesterday but yeah um, yeah okay i figured you knew but just wanted to call it out yeah but it's i have it on another uh org where i've been playing with bill jet for before yesterday and I was seeing uh, similar behavior from GitHub. I don't know if GitHub was degraded for a couple of days. Um, it could be. I can't rule it out. I've noticed a lot of weirdness around GitHub since, I don't know, a week ago. Okay. Um, but definitely yesterday was terrible. And, and what exactly is BuildJet? Um, they are a built a CI as a service. And uh, they, the, the the whole reason I started looking into them was that they provide um, arm builders, which mm -hmm. was really interesting to me. Um, so this is, you know, what I see, you know, for, oh, I didn't do any arm over there. So it's on three repos right now. Uh, Cacti has spent eleven dollars in less than twenty four hours. Noncred spent, you know, almost a dollar. So, um, it's it's fast. Their whole thing is fast, fast, fast. And my testing shows that that's true. They have a free tier where you can play with it, which is what I did last week to build. What I was trying to do was uh, build ARM and XA6 Docker images for old fabric releases um, for 
so that we could have a, a single container for the fabric bits. And that took forever and I didn't get anywhere. Um, but that's, I mean, that's the whole reason that I was interested in BuildJet is they have fast arm builders. So, Timo? Um, yeah, I'm thinking like, should we look more at, for example, for Anoncred, you say like it cost a dollar or something you said. Um, I know for the project for each PR, we are building like the Rust binaries um, um, for each of the different platforms, different architectures. So that's like a lot. They all run in parallel and then we run tests on all of them. And um, um, I mean, we could also look at changing that like, all right, test for PR tests are simple. We just test like the standard end-to-end uh, -end test on, for example, Linux. and um, the whole process of all binaries, all tests, all platforms is something we start doing on a nightly basis or more of like when the runners are not utilized that much. And then we can move more of the heavy load to doing that when the runner uses on GitHub is low and that we still have like uh, for each PR, we have just like the, the, the biggest coverage of like what is um what we want to test is that something we want to look at or is it still like we want to find a solution where we can just like i, I really like that we could always just like not worry at all about the, the runners um and just <laughs> test what you want but uh yeah if it's like if there's a price tag being attached to it we may want to revamp how we test and, and run ci also a bit sure this is part of a longer discussion um right now i would say don't worry about it for the next couple of weeks. Um, we're, like I said, we're going to talk to Stormy this afternoon. Um, I know that we've had conversations about how do we, like, if you are a project, uh, Hart, do you want to talk to this? If you're, uh, you know, if the, the, the spend for projects that have graduated and the projects that are in incubating. Heart might not be. We, yeah, we, sorry, no, I'm here. I'm just trying to find the mute button. All right. Um, yeah, eventually, like we don't have a historically, we've never had a spend policy for you know, uh, for CI/CD stuff, and this has sort of just been you know, it's been very ad hoc, and when things have gotten out of hand, you know, we've sort of you know had staff reach out and basically say, hey, you know. Um, uh, uh you know it, it's time you know you need to you need to cut this down because we, this is a untenable amount of spending um but eventually you know we know that projects need to spend money on this and we'd like to have some kind of you know formal policy on uh on ci spending uh so yeah i mean we're we're open to suggestions on this um if people think they have good ways of making it work so I think a lot of people have raised hands, so I th should let them talk. All right, Jim. Yeah, I just want to validate one thing. I may have heard this uh, uh, incorrectly, but did projects have uh, nightly builds uh, running like CI builds for, um, I guess, regression purposes? That seems to be overkill. I mean, we have we don't host any services that are deployed on clouds. It's just code. I don't think a, a nightly or regularly scheduled CI is warranted. Or maybe I heard it wrong. Um, Stephen, I'm going to skip you for a moment because I think Timo yeah. has an answer to that. Sounds good. Yeah. No, no, I wasn't like suggesting we do that to do nightly it's more uh currently in the repo there's a lot more like there's multiple pull requests um each day and each of the pull requests runs the whole uh, uh suit of tests which is a, a gigantic matrix because we have worst binaries for different platforms then we have tests for all those different platforms and each platform also has different architectures. And then we also have different wrappers in different languages. So the matrix of what's being tested is, is huge. And um, my thinking was 
we could probably reduce the load of a single pull request by 90% if we just test a single platform uh, with a single architecture for each pull request and then have more like non-regular, like once in a while test that just test the whole matrix still. But it was more of like a suggestion to reduce the load uh, by doing it on, for example, a nightly basis. All right, thanks, Timo. Uh, Steven? Um, is there any visibility to the metrics of, of, what's, of what's being consumed? I've never seen a report like the one you showed, Rai, of, of that um, build jet screen. I don't know if GitHub has the same thing, but that would seem to be super useful, was um, making visible what, what the projects are using and therefore under you know you know as Timo said we've never worried about it so we just did stuff <laughs> so um getting a message out um would be helpful to know what what things are being consumed uh I agree uh so if I look here I see we have six active jobs and I can see that these are building but I there's no uh, historical data okay and I have searched through the uh I looked at the audit log to see if there was anything in here about, you know, builds uh, in terms of GitHub Actions. There's nothing in here. Uh, there's there's nothing that I can tell about what, you know, what project did what at what time without basically crawling the entire yeah. uh, GitHub API for each repo constantly yeah. or uh you know loading this screen uh you know getting this data on my own yeah. there, there's just no historical usage per repo or per anything so uh -huh. I, I i wish there was yeah okay ultimately that's what we need because then we could self-police and figure out how to make sure we're 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 being valuable in our use of it since suddenly it's become a a uh a precious resource sure think, right and that's what we're going to talk about with stormy later today marcus i think this is a super interesting topic i mean as mentioned here before i mean previously nobody actually was seeing the bill so uh, they just did whatever they wanted to do in the github action job in order to test whatever needs to be tested and I mean from my own experience I, I see that it's sometimes super easy just to to test the entire thing for a PR instead of uh, doing some smart thing and um, I mean just double check if you really need to run the entire test pipeline if you just um, I don't know did an update on documentation for instance so there's absolutely no need to rebuild the code and all the stuff right um, I actually I was wondering so if I mean, all the discussions and recommendations uh, uh, we can, can come up with, I mean, this sh uh, could be ideally piped in directly into the project best practices. I, I agree. Uh, and I know that you can limit um, CI based on the branch or whatever. So you can, you can skip stuff. Um, I don't have the answers right now. I promise. Next week, I will try to. And I see that Dave Inyart wants to share his screen. But so if someone uh, forks a repository and essentially develops their pushes to this, uh, to his fork, then this is not charged uh, right. from the Hyperledger account, right? So that only the, let's say the the PR, which goes in into the main repository, then uh, need, will fire the CI. Right. There's something else there, which is um, I don't have a way to limit it per project. And I've noticed that the way GitHub does it is very greedy. So like if uh, whatever project gets in, like if when Cacti gets in and they have 400 jobs in one PR, uh, once one of them runs, uh, GitHub is going to drain that queue for that specific PR it's not round robin so that's why we see like when a job or when a PR starts running 
it runs to completion, but your whole PR might wait forever. Dave? Uh, yeah, so I was taking some notes while we we're talking here, adding some things to the project best practices. So while we're on this topic, I could show I could show this instead of doing it next half hour. Uh, but yeah, I do have some ideas in here. Uh, of course, Ryan mentioned the build jet. He's he's trying. In the last week's meeting, we talked about these two. I think cancel in progress and then unchecking this require branches to be up to date before merging. Both of these will um, suppress redundant builds. Uh, like Marcus was saying, you can use filters um, to make sure you're not doing unnecessary runs like you don't need to do uh, code, build, and test if it's a doc PR, that type of thing. Uh, of course, we talked with Timo about, you know, you could do some things nightly instead of everyone, like the various platform tests, and um, we do some of our scans nightly also. So, like others have said, people have just gotten in the habit of doing whatever they wanted because it, it was free to them, perceived to be free to them. And now that we're having these considerations, I think there's a lot of things we could do, at least the, some of the most egregious uses could be cut down fairly, fairly considerably so. That's it. All right. Any other? Um, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> Sorry, quick comment. That's um, okay. Uh, one thought on that last one of running on a schedule rather than on each pull request. Um, I assume, but I, I don't know. Again, I'm not. I, I'm not on this on a daily basis. But it, are there ways to run? some GitHub actions locally um, before doing pull requests. And then can we make that a best practice that people have guidance on how to run, you know, particular tests? It, I guess it would be on a per project basis, but they could say, you know, make sure you run these tests before submitting and, and then we'll run it on, on a nightly basis. But you, you know, get feedback before you um, you do your, mer your, your commit. I don't know, ah, never mind. Well, no, you can definitely have them run when you push your change to your uh, to your branch on your on your own fork in GitHub. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can run them there before opening the PR. Yeah, so that definitely, was, that's a good idea. And then and then people could at least say, "Oh, okay, I ran these things um, as part of the um, the the pre merge the the pull request." Anyway, good. Any other thoughts on GitHub actions or um, best practices that Dave could add here while we're uh, at this point? Peter? I heard it mentioned, but I don't see it. Uh, the one where if it's a documentation change only, then you don't need to run the build. That's this one, yep. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Sorry. And then the other one that I've been thinking about for Cacti is, well, it's also filters, but I would specifically clarify that if you have a mono repo like we do, then you could also have a dependency analysis within the packages. And if you changed one package out of the 40 packages that we have and that package doesn't depend on any of the other packages then you don't need to run the tests for any of the other packages just at one package but this is a mono repo specific yeah i think that's a good idea i think each project can do their <laughs> their own assessment there yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on GitHub actions or recommendations for best practices that could go into this document? Okay. Um, so then before we do get to the best practices, um, one thing that did come up uh, that's not on the agenda 
um, but it's something that the TFC will be um, responsible for approving is we did get a new request for a lab steward that came in this week. Um, I think it was came in yesterday uh, and uh, wanted to bring that up to the to the TOC today to see if we wanted to talk about that today or if we wanted to um, wait. I know um, Nidhi is on the, the call here uh, who has been suggested as a lab steward. So I uh, didn't know if we wanted to have that conversation today or not. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. So I'll just briefly talk about myself and uh, why I wish to be a lab steward. Right. So myself, Nidhi Singh, like I have been involved with the Hyperledger Foundation and the associated projects for around four years now. And currently, I majorly contribute to the HLF Connector project and the EAT Connector project, which are under the Hyperledger Labs. And in addition to that, if uh, time permits, I try to contribute to uh, Bevel as well. And I'm closely following the developments in the interop space and the identity space. And I feel the lab steward is like a great responsibility and opportunity for me to know any new developments in this area. And I also participate as Hyperledger India chapter lead, developer advocate lead. So this role will help me in uh, assisting new projects, which will be proposed to labs and uh, guide them as needed within the Hyperledger Foundation. And I also understand uh, like the POC has said like a uh, low barrier for the new Hyperledger Labs project. And uh, I'll try to ensure that the projects uh, have like sufficient resources so that uh, we can make them stronger. So yeah, uh, that's what I want to say. I look forward to your thoughts uh, regarding my nomination. All right, thank you for that. Um, so any, any comments, concerns, thoughts from the TOC members? I think we should welcome the help. All right. Thanks, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, plus one. Agreed. No concerns. Okay. So can we can we do a quick vote then? Um, can we have a motion to, to do the vote? Motion. And second. a second. A second. Second. All right, thank you. Uh, can we just do a not not a, a roll call vote, but can we yeah. ride? Can we go through and do the approve, reject, yeah. whatever? Yeah. Uh, all those who are wish to abstain, please say abstain. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And all those against, say nay. The motion it passes by voice vote. All right, thank you. And, and Nidhi, welcome to uh, the lab steward role. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the lab stewards that are uh, already there. And, and we're happy to have you help us out uh, in approving uh, and commenting on the different lab proposals that do come in. Yeah, this is so awesome. Thank you so much. I look forward. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Any other topics before we get to the best practices that we should talk about? No, uh, Peter. Just a quick one. I am still working on an issue for Transact, the documentation. It is a quick one, but, uh, I just didn't get around to do it, but I will get it done today. Sorry about uh, it being slower. All right, thanks, Peter, for the the update on that. Appreciate oh. that. Any other topics before we hand it off to Dave? No. 
Nope, I think the floor is yours, Dave. Okay. So in the last meeting where we talked about this, we at least started to look at the security um, section. And I know there's a task force or two in progress. So I, I don't think we need to spend time on that. Uh, let the task force deal with that. And same with documentation. Um, Bobby gave us an update on the documentation task force last week. And it looks like there's a lot of good things like common styling guide, uh, recommended common publishing platform, best practices for creating documentation. So these are all tasks within that task force. So again, I think we can delegate that discussion to the documentation task force, but I'll pause a minute here if anybody has any burning things they wanna add at this time to either security or documentation. I'll let you holler now. I had a wonderful time creating a new documentation website and we'll have much to add to the um, documentation template that uh, Tracy created. Lots of fun. Will we Excellent. see? You, will we hear from you Monday at noon so you can catch us up? Alas, I can't make that meeting, but I'll certainly, uh, I'll certainly get the documents in. Thank you. Okay, so we'll circle back to security and documentation after um, a couple more rounds in those task forces. But let's move on. Maybe we'll get through the rest of these today, or at least close to it. Um, so a lot of these best practices kind of related to project management, but there were a few areas that were purely project management. I thought we'd call, call them out separately. And in fact, when um, I think it was Stephen did the uh, PR about the uh, maintainers file, um, he had some roles and responsibility for maintainers, which triggered my thought that we should, we should highlight these in the best practices doc as well. Um, so in, for, in terms of project management, the ones that are purely project management, at least, I thought we should have a bullet about the roadmap and also how to handle issues in GitHub. So uh, for the roadmap, I suggest a written project roadmap for every project and discuss that, you know, not, maybe not every um, project meeting, but regular, regularly in project meetings. And then for um, GitHub issues, I kind of think of these in, in two ways. One is outbound and inbound issues. So outbound issues are issues that the project maintainers and project contributors uh, make that the things they know about that need to be done in the project. Um, and they should be, you know, clear and they should have good labels like good first issue for things that a new contributor could potentially pick up. And then there's also um, GitHub issues that I consider more like inbound issues, like people having an issue with the project, they open an issue, those should be reviewed regularly, triaged, comment on, commented on, and then closed once resolution is, is achieved. So I know that's uh, just a, a light touch on project management. I don't want to boil the ocean here, but I'll pause here for any other, other suggestions on project management. Yeah, so Dave, I, I actually have a question, I think maybe towards Rye. Rye, do we have a list of uh, standard labels that are used for all of the Hyperledger projects uh, as a default set or um, we, we, is we that do. possible? We do okay. and it is, it is possible and we are using basically the GitHub defaults um, and I can change those at will. So let me know what you want. I have taken okay. a look at the GitHub defaults. They seemed reasonable to me. Great. Thank you. Peter? We took uh, the good first issue label apart into four different pieces in Cacti, and that was popular with first time contributors for Hacktoberfest or uh, something else where we had to do that. We made it uh, the same structure that you get at conferences about tech talks when they have level 100, 200, 300, 400. 100 being the absolute beginner, 400 is the expert. And the thinking behind this is that there's two types of good first issues. One is a good first issue because you don't need to know 
the actual code of the project to well uh, to contribute or to fix that issue. But the other type of good first issue, uh, sorry, I didn't say it right. So one is when it's a good first issue because you don't need any experience. Uh, the other type is a good first issue where you still need to understand something really well. You need to be an expert in it, but it's not related to the project itself. For example, when there's something uh, deeply uh, embedded in one of our containers, it's about the subnets that Docker creates on specifically Mac, and then someone who's an expert at networking needs to go in there and fix that. We usually make that a good first issue with a level 400, which means that you do need to be an expert in networking, but you don't actually need to know much about Cacti itself for you to be able to fix that issue. And therefore, it still is a good first issue, but not necessarily in the way that someone fresh out of college would think is a good first issue. Yes, that, that short sentence sums up very nicely what I was just trying to say. Thank you. So what are the actual labels? Is it like good first issue dash 100? That's exactly what it is, yes. Okay. So the, the labels match the name of the original label, but then dash 100, 200, 300, 400. Okay, any other thoughts? So, um, quick comment on the same thing, right? On the first crime contributors experience perspective. Um, one of the other thing that might help at least for the first time contributors is I know all the projects majorly at least focus on the user user code, I mean user base who try to access the project and try to use those projects in their use cases. Um, very few of them have a technical detailed explanations put up in the documentation. And it would be helpful if we have those um, information as well available in any form. It could be either in form, form of, um, um, uh, let's say, a design document with diagrams within the documentation section, or it could be like the video presentations, the, the thought process behind the current design that the project came up with and why they chose certain design versus the other. Instead of user guide, it would be mostly on the design side of the project. So I do have a bullet saying exactly what you're talking about, that in addition to user guides, it'd be good to have project developer guides. We already had bullets around like coding guidelines, build instructions, test instructions, but I think you're right. Design docs and things of that nature would, would be important as well. Uh, Rama? Can I ask? Yeah. So Arun, you're talking about RFCs, right? I mean, I think many of the projects have uh, RFCs with a uh, lot of uh, design rationale and diagrams and stuff like that. I agree. So I specifications. Know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know a okay. few of the projects have come up with RFC, uh, but this started after the, all the initial uh, design were finalized. Like the RFCs are being followed for the new features. Um, it will help if we have uh, that standardized across projects. Yeah. Agree. And, and we were going to have, I think the recommendation was to have a, the RFC in a separate repo, right? Yes. Okay. 
Bobby? The um, one of the onboarding task forces uh, jobs is to organize these user guides um, and instructions uh, templated or however to get onboarding much easier. So that also meets on Monday. So I encourage everybody to come out for that call too. <laughs> Okay, anybody else want to make any other suggestions around project management before we move on? Okay, let's go to releases. So that kind of also goes under project management. But uh, for releases, we do have a release taxonomy that was created a long time ago. I think it's still valid. Uh, it suggests either you're following a Semver or Calver uh, scheme for releases. I think most projects are probably using Semver. Uh, along with that kind of goes an overall release strategy, release process and a branching strategy. It would be good to get that written down in the documentation somewhere. Um, for example, a branching strategy can go hand in hand with um, Semver, you know, where you've got one branch per major dot minor release, and that lets you that lets you maintain a release, a minor release in isolation while delivering uh, patch releases against that. So that's what we do in Fabric, and I think some other projects do that as well. Uh, it'd be good to document um, a long term on, support release strategy. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, Art Art has a his hand up and I'm guessing it's related to the release uh, strategy there. Uh, it is. I Yeah, thanks, Tracy. I didn't necessarily want to interrupt, um, but I think it would be useful if we explicitly call out that projects should document what approval process is required to cut a release. Um, if, if you all agree with that. There's been some ambiguity in certain projects in the past. Okay, I noted that here. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so uh, some projects have long-term support releases, so it's important to document with that as if you have one, um, what the criteria is and what the uh, impacts are to users. Uh, in terms of the actual release process, uh, we found it's good to use GitHub Actions to actually um, do that, to automate that so you don't miss a step uh, or have some inconsistency. So for example, uh, you can have GitHub Actions publish artifacts, um, publish the release notes and so on. And in terms of the artifacts, um, it's good practice to publish the any binaries that you build along with the GitHub release. And then I have an open question here about Docker images. So some projects, including Fabric, uh, we've got images um, that we maintain on Docker Hub. I know there's kind of an evolution of things towards uh, GitHub. So GitHub does have GitHub packages, which makes a nice place to put images. Uh, we'll have to figure out in Fabric how we evolve that over time um, so that we don't impact users as we do that. But then I did have a question also about with GitHub packages, does, it, does anybody know about any size limitations? So, I mean, if every project starts doing this, are we gonna hit a similar thing that we are with the runners where there's uh, only so no, only so many, um, so much space the, the images can take up for an, for an organization? Does anybody know? I'm not aware of any. I will ask that question uh, if it comes up later today. Um, I did go through and disable uh, LFS. We had two projects that were using LFS uh, for historic reasons. So I, I went ahead and disabled that. That was limited, but I haven't heard of any limits. Peter? Uh, it might be outdated because it's been at least a couple of years since I looked this up, but uh, we had ideas to publish canary releases for every commit for our npm packages and the limit on npm packages uh, for versions is 1000 and they don't have documentation on what happens when you reach 1000 
so yeah recommendation for now unless this has been changed is to not publish npm packages on every commit because uh, at commit 1000 you will likely hit some trouble and what are those called modules or what are they called in NP M npm world uh packages packages And then I assume there's something for Docker too, but uh, I have not seen it documented either. It's probably one of those questions that rarely comes up and then they just don't really have it out front. So just put a link in the chat, um, in Discord chat for this meeting. There is limits um, that reset every month. Uh, for data transfer, but not for storage. Uh, or this says the data transfer resets every month while storage usage does not. And it gives a, a table that basically provides the limits for storage and, and data transfer. So um, there are definitely some limits there that exist for GitHub packages. I can add that link to the, the page, Dave. Thank you. Okay, other thoughts on release processes and so on? Hey, hey Dave. Um, for, for the very first bullet, would it be worth uh, going to more details when um, you're considering either beta releases or release candidates? Seems like every project does things a bit differently. I think it's called out fairly well in this document we linked to around release taxonomy. I know this is old and a lot of people haven't seen this, but there's a pretty good description of what should be a called a preview versus alpha versus beta and their consistent naming between these. I don't know oh, if that's you've seen great. This, I, haven't Jim. Seen, I haven't seen that before. That's great. Looks like Peter has a send up. Yes, uh, so I, I wanted two quick more items as recommendations because they're they're not easy. One is uh, try to have reproducible builds, e.g. next year if I check out the specific commit you tagged your release with, I should be able to reproduce the binaries bit by bit that matches it. And the second is if you have, like it is recommended to sign those commits and then also sign the binaries, but I know this is a lot of effort and I know it's underway. Some of it, this is underway in the security task force or maybe in the open stuff. So I just, I, for now, I just put it down as a recommendation. So how would you summarize that in a bullet? Okay, two bullets. One, uh, have reproducible builds. And then there's a website for that called reproduciblebuilds.org or something. One second, I'm just doing the search. Yes, I'm putting it on the chat. So I would put that link there as well, just so that if someone wants to read a lot, they can. And then the second bullet is sign the commits pertaining to releases and sign the artifacts if possible. So I think the task force that was proposed talks about artifacts does it also uh, consider commits? How do you sign a commit? Uh, there's a dash dash gpg dash sign flag on git. And if you have set up your uh, keys, then it will just automatically sign it and it, it will include, no, actually it won't. Yeah, so it will sign it, the commit itself. And uh, say that again, dash dash what? GPG dash sign. 
Yeah, you have to do an initial setup basically, and then once it's set up, it's automatic. It actually shows on the on GitHub when. Yep, the, it shows up as the green verified label next right. to commits. Okay, so we'll get a link to those instructions. Put it here. Okay. And then the artifacts is kind of is kind of the broader task force uh, proposal, right, Arno? Signing yes. the artifacts. Yep. I don't think that task force is kicked off yet, but it's in queue. Right. And honestly, the trouble with the GPG sign signature is that you have to deal with keys and people are generally not good at handling keys for a long time. Me being the first. <laughs> Just yeah. when I was trying to get that set up, I screwed up and lost my key in a matter of <laughs> very little time. I was embarrassing. Uh, I'm on my third key. Oh, there you yes. go. <laughs> That's why I said optional, recommended. Do it if you can, but you know, good luck. Okay, good suggestions here. Anything else for releases? Okay, we're getting close to the end. Uh, so we talked about CI a little bit already in terms of GitHub Actions and some things you can do to limit the number of runners. Um, also just basic recommendations here for uh, the types of checks you might wanna do in CI. So of course, uh, I think we're, we require the DCO check, uh, then um, unit tests, integration tests, and various security scans are also a good idea. Again, so you could consider moving some of those to nightly if they are um, either lower value or expensive to run. Um, there are some ways to get reports on test coverage. I think we found it's, you don't have to do that every PR. You can do that either on demand or nightly when you want to check that out. Of course, uh, it's always a good idea to keep your CI pipelines clean and green, as I say. Um, a lot of times there will be failures or flakes, and if you don't address them quickly, then there'll be like a, a snowball effect where it's hard, it's harder to untangle them if you don't keep up with them as they come. So it's always best to keep it clean and green at all times. We don't always do that, but we, we try. Uh, and then there's also a task force um, around automated pipelines. I forget who proposed this one, but I think that one is in queue, right? I don't think that's started yet. That's correct. And I think Stephen was the one who suggested that one. Okay, so it's good. We'll have some people going deeper in this topic, but we have a few minutes left if anybody else has ideas around continuous integration best practices. Okay, we only have one more section. We could try this in three minutes. Not General, sorry. Uh, say that again. Oh, sorry, David. I was just thinking through. Uh, it's not an idea, but rather something that we we should think towards I, because I don't have a solution handy. Um, I remember there was an incident where we had to block people from, from um, spamming across different repositories. And it's maybe directly related to the maintainer's experience as well. Instead of just thinking about new users and then the uh, experience for the new uh, people who come in, I think we should also discuss about the current maintainer's responsibilities and current maintainers, what they go through. And this happened in, in very recent that I can remember of. Um, I don't have a solution handy for this. I don't know a solution that we can propose. But there were incidents where somebody tried to add in malicious code across different repositories. And in few of the repositories, it was also merged. And there is nothing to blame here on the maintainers because they rely on the pipelines. 
and those were tested fine. And if the build and, and the tools are saying it is right, the maintainers have very little to say about it, but those were reverted after some period. This is something we need a solution for, and I don't have a solution handy, just wanted to bring up the topic. So are you bringing it up in terms of how we propose to block spammers like this, or is the proposal more around CI how to catch bad commits that are coming in? Which, which area did you want to take that? I, as I said, I don't have a solution handy. Uh, I don't know how to solve this problem. Um, but if people have uh, time, maybe they can think through how they can, how they would like to resolve this. I guess my initial thought is how was that uh, malicious code eventually got discovered and why wasn't what wasn't that called first? Seems like it's um, it falls on the committers who reviewed the code, right? Right. If, as far as I recall this situation, some of the first PRs weren't necessarily obvi obviously malicious. And then as it went, they got more obvious. And then uh, we went back and looked at all the PRs that that person had done. And we realized, yes, they were all trying to do nefarious things. So it sounds like it's a pretty elaborate, um, uh, progressive, quote unquote, attack. I, I don't know, um, other than rely on human doing the, 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 the right intelligence investigations, not sure if this can be automated. At least for the type of incidents that that sounds like um, is happening here. I agree. Maybe we can have a best practice guidelines for maintainers or or make them be wary of such incidents. So I'll put a bullet here around pull request checks. Be wary. I mean, this is obvious, but we'll work on the wording here. So I guess okay. we'll close With out here. That, we're out of time, yeah. Yeah. Um, Arun, I think you're up next on the security task force for next week. Uh, so we'll look forward to that discussion and everybody have a great week. Thanks, okay, thanks everybody. Have Thank you. Bye. Bye.